Welcome to this week's episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. Almost 30 years ago, uh, when Andrea and I were in seminary, we lived in a mobile home park that was a few miles away from the seminary. And um, we had a man who lived behind us, an older man, uh, his wife and their son, that kind of helped look after the mobile home park. In fact, we affectionately referred to him as the mayor of the mobile home park. He wasn't in any kind of official capacity like that, but that's what we called him uh, because he just really cared about all the residents who there who were there and especially those who lived right around him. We lived right in front of him and uh, he helped uh, look after us. He helped look after our dogs. Um, just very, very special man and his family. He would do anything for you. And uh, he kind of took over the responsibility of cutting our grass for us. Every now and then we would come home. He was not a Christian, didn't go to church. We would invite him to go some and he just, he never was interested in it. Um, every now and then we would come home from church on Sunday and he would be cutting our grass. And he knew that because we were church people and I was a seminary student, I might not be real happy with him cutting grass on Sunday because back then there's some things you just didn't do on Sunday. You know, you cut your grass, ladies didn't wash clothes, you didn't go fishing. Um, a lot of people wouldn't go out to eat because uh, you don't want to call somebody else to have to work on Sunday, all kinds of things like that. And, um, but he would always justify what he was doing by reminding us that Jesus did say that if your ox, if your neighbor's ox was in the ditch, it was okay on the Sabbath to help get the ox out of the ditch. Uh, he didn't exactly deal too well with context, did he? Uh, but, um, you know, we loved him anyway, and of course we were appreciative that he took care of cutting the grass for us. But he, he even understood that for Christians, Sunday was a special day. It was a day that was set apart to be different and that we treated that day differently. Uh, Andrea took a class uh, in seminary uh, with some other seminary wives. And one of the things they did was they talked about some things that they collected and they, they took turns bringing in some of their collectibles. This one particular lady uh, collected uh, old hymnals. And uh, Andrea came home and was telling me about the old hymnal collection. And there was this one particular song that they all got a kick out of. And um, the title of the song was Ain't It a Shame. And I won't read to you all the words I've, I've actually got I found a uh, had a, a lady a organist in one of our previous churches I was talking about this and she found the music and copied it so that we we would have this it's hilarious when you think about it but it you know it's ain't it a shame to work on Sunday ain't it a sin and a shame it's a working shame ain't it a sin to work on Sunday and then the refrain kind of says when you have Sunday Monday Tuesday and when you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, ain't it a shame to work on Sunday? Well, the funny part, I mean, then you got verses like, ain't it a shame to joy ride on Sunday? Uh, when, you know, and then you ended up when you've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, ain't it a sin and a shame? But the funny part is the last two verses are, ain't it a sin to gossip on Sunday and and a sin to lie on Sunday. So the idea is it's a sin to gossip and lie on Sunday when you've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, that it's okay to gossip and lie on those days, but not on Sunday. Of course, uh, they I don't think they, again, thought of context uh, with, that, with that song. But there was a time in our culture when Sunday was viewed as a different day. And uh, I think we've kind of lost some of the... Um, specialness of Sunday. Now, Sunday became uh, the, the holy day for Christians uh, slowly during the Christian era uh, as the, the early church began to celebrate on the first day of the week to commemorate the resurrection of Christ. And as they began to draw away from the, uh, the, the law-keeping of their Judaistic heritage, began to forge this new faith for themselves, they saw the identity rather being in the Ten Commandments, being in the resurrection of Jesus. And by the time of Constantine in the fourth century, uh, it was pretty much the standard practice that Sunday was the holy day. Now, I just want to say this. It, it's one thing to make Sunday different. It's another thing altogether to make Sunday special. And so I just want to encourage you as we think through in the next few minutes, this fourth commandment to remember the Sabbath day 
Think about ways that you can make worship of the Lord on this one day special. You need to do that. You need the physical rest of that day, but you need the spiritual refocus of that day. So when we take our families away from church, when we let other things get in the way of church, we're saying, okay, I need the physical rest. We need the getaway, but spiritually it's not important. And other people will say, well, I can worship God without going to church. Well, you can't really be obedient to Christ without going to church because the church is a collective group. We were called out to be together. We were told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We, we need to worship together. We need that for spiritual focus. And then another thing I want to just kind of point out before we get to our scripture is that as with all of the uh, commandments, all of the Old Testament, it all pointed to Christ, that God would one day redeem fallen man and restore the image of God by recreating in us, or recreating us into the image of his son, Jesus. And Sabbath is a very big part of that. That day of worship is that. In fact, don't you know that Jesus is our Sabbath rest? Because it is, Jesus is the one that kept us from having to keep the law perfectly. He came and fulfilled the law, fulfilled all the law's demands, and then died so that we didn't have to fulfill the law's demands to be right with God. We're right through him. So he is our Sabbath rest. And it's important to look at this not in such legalistic terms, but to look at it in gospel terms, that the reason we take a day to worship is not to be spiritually superior to someone else or to earn brownie points with God. We do it to recognize the Savior who died, who was buried, and who rose again. We could be made right with God. When you stop and think about it, there's nothing that we could do on a day of worship more important than recognizing the finished work of Christ in our life. So think about it that way. I'm going to pray and then we're going to dig into our scripture. What I want to do uh, this morning is I just want to uh, take some time to give you, I think, two concepts that will help you make your day of worship more special. All right. And that's the way we're going to look at it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for loving us, even in our sin, for sending your son, Jesus, to redeem us and your Holy Spirit to regenerate, restore us. Thank you for working to create in us what we could not do ourselves. And that is to restore your image in us. Uh, Lord, unite our hearts to fear you, to serve you, to, to live for you, and to follow you in all of our ways. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 20. And we'll look at verses 8 through 11. Let's read the scriptures together, shall we? In Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, God says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So as we consider these passages of scripture, as I said, I, I want to challenge you to think about making church attendance on the Lord's day, a priority for you and your family, because we need that spiritual refocus. And it's not just about going to church on Sunday morning and then getting on with other things in your day. How can we take a whole day to be reminded of the goodness of God, and the grace of God that is found in the finished work of his son, Jesus? that that would so refocus our life that it would give us a new perspective to live out the rest of the week. We start the first day of the week focusing so that we can live the rest of the week with a gospel mindset. So two things I want to encourage you to do. First of all, I want to remind you to consecrate the day. Now by that, that means to set it 
apart. God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, special. It's not like any other day. Uh, now, there, I think there are, there are three wrong ways we can look at the Sabbath. We can be legalistic about it, kind of like that song, Ain't It a Sin and a Shame. Well, you know, if you don't, you can't, you, you can't do any of these things on Sunday or you're, or you're breaking it all together. Or you can, you can be what I call minimalistic about it. Uh, being minimalistic about it means, well, you know, okay, yeah, it's a special day. I'm going to church. I got my church in and then we'll move on to something else. I, I pastored a church one time that had, we had two services, uh, an 8.30 service and 11 o'clock service. And there was always discussion about combining the two services. And if we combined them, what time would we have them? And I literally had somebody tell me, this is, this is the truth. Had somebody tell me, well, I like the 8.30 service because I can come on to church and get it over with and have the rest of my day. Let that sink in for a minute. Get it over with. That's minimalizing Sunday. Uh, that's turning it into a superstition. That's just checking it off as we did our religious duty that day. A third way that we can, I think, misappropriate, and this is what happens to most people today, is indifference. Uh, just disregard it. Oh, this is another day we have off work. Or, you know, th this is on Saturday. I got to do all my yard work, all my work at the house. Saturday is Sunday is my day to have the family. We can kind of rest and relax and get ready to go back to school and work. As if church can't be a very important part of that. And worship and fellowship with the body of Christ is not uh, really the most important part of preparing yourself for the week to come. So I want to challenge you to consecrate. Sunday, to set it apart as, as holy. Why? Because, not because that 24-hour period is holy, but because the concept of recognizing the finished work of Christ, to coming together with other believers in the body of Christ, to celebrate the finished work of Christ, is the highest and most noble thing that we could do. So what is your attitude about Sunday. Um, if your attitude about a Sunday is not to see it for what God intended it, a blessed, precious time for us to shun off the rest of the world and to make this day not just different, but make this day special by focusing on him, letting him nurture us and feed us, letting him spiritually restore us and refresh us, then I, I want to ask, I pray that you would ask God to, to show you where your heart is in that. Do you view Sundays? And let me, let me just throw this in and we'll move on. I think if we're not careful, even as churches, now listen to me carefully. I'm going to lean in. Listen to me real careful here, okay? Even as churches, we can make Sunday so busy that it's no longer consecrated. We got to have this meeting then and this meeting there. We try to cram so much in while everybody's here or since they're coming anyway. And our distraction, we are distracted from worship. We are distracted. I mean, think of it this way. If you go to a traditional Baptist church, and when I say traditional, I mean one that's kind of set up schedule-wise like the majority are. You have a, a morning Bible study that usually starts you know, around 9, 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Then you have a worship service that starts, depending on when your Sunday school started, anywhere from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. It goes to, depending on when it started, anywhere from 11 o'clock to 12, 1230. You stand around and talk. You may be, then you go somewhere and get some lunch. You're two o'clock getting done with it. Well, then you've got a meeting uh, at 3.30 or 4 o'clock. And so you had an hour and a half maybe of downtime. Then you come to this meeting. You sit in this meeting till about 5 or 6 o'clock. Then you have some other kind of class or worship or something else on Sunday night. Then you have that, and then you're done with that. And, and by the time you get home, it's 7 or 8 o'clock, and you have just been going all day since about 8 o'clock in the morning. And really, your rhythm is the same as it is on a work day. You've been gone from 
nine o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night or eight o'clock in the morning to six or seven o'clock at night. And the only thing different about it is what you did in that time. You didn't punch a time clock and, and work at your secular job. You, you worked at church. So pastors, church leaders, let me encourage you to think about consecrating the Lord's day. I'm not saying we shouldn't have Sunday night church. Don't hear me say that either. I think Sunday night church is a very good thing. I think it re, but it needs to reinforce the goal. It doesn't need to be, I'm talking about maybe all the in between and before and after we need to rethink. Are we consecrating this day and are we optimizing this day? Let me write that word down. Are we optimizing this day to help people focus on the Lord, to worship, and to be spiritually refreshed? So my first challenge is consecrate. My second challenge for all of us is to prepare. I've heard people say that um, Sunday morning church is a Saturday night decision, and I agree with that in part. I just think it goes back before Saturday night. I think it really, I think all of your week can be planned with Sunday in view, even your Monday and your Monday nights and thinking about how you schedule everything so that everything doesn't fall to Saturday so that you got to cram everything into Saturday and then you're exhausted when Sunday rolls around. How do you spread out your week? Um, how do you, how do you plan the week? to be prepared to worship on Sunday. Another way you then you look at it is how do you prepare your Saturday? I take very few engagements on Saturday nights. Occasionally we'll get together with some friends and when we do, we usually do so early, um, earlier in the evening. I like to be home by eight or nine o'clock and settling down. Um, on Saturday, it's a good time to get your clothes together, know where your Bible is, anything else you need on Sunday, to have everything ready so that you don't wake up on Sunday morning in wide open mode, having to get everything ready to go to church. You, you prepare for as much leading up to. But then, how do you prepare yourself on Sunday? What do you do with your mind? What do you do with your heart? How much have you prayed before you come into church? Listen, I've been pastoring for since 1988. So I pastored several churches. I listen to people when they move from Sunday school into church or when they're coming in church. And to hear the complaining, uh, the critical spirit, the gossip, and they're bringing all of this in to worship God. Hearts are not ready to worship God. And then we blame it on the music. Or we blame it on the preacher. And we just didn't get anything out of it today. We didn't get anything out of it because we didn't bring anything to it or because we brought foul hearts to it. I don't, I don't want you to speed past that. And here we are so many minutes into the video. I hope you haven't. You know, some people have probably tuned out and missed this altogether. But if you're here, you're providentially here. God wants you to hear this. Be careful what you bring in your mind and your heart to worship. Don't come in ready to share the latest news or to find out the latest gossip. Don't come in to be critical. Don't come, you know, don't come in so cluttered. Jesus told the parable of the souls, and one of the souls, he said, they were just so full of of the cares of this world, they were that, that when the seed was planted, it was choked out by all the weeds and other stuff growing in, all the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for all these things, all this stuff. Come in prepared to worship. Come in prepared to, to devote your, your heart to God, to sing to him, to encourage each other, to, to listen to, to prayers, to listen to God's word, to listen to a message, to listen to God speak. Come in prepared, having prepared yourself for the whole week, prepared yourself the day before, but especially, especially that morning. Now, I want to close out just by sharing something with you. This is from Tom Rayner. Tom Rayner used to be president of Lifeway. Um, I'm going to make this available. There'll be a link 
Uh, you, you should be seeing that link somewhere at the bottom right now, um, where if you go to this page, there'll be a link to this article, okay? And it, the title of the article is Preparing for Worship. But I want, I want to take just a moment, and I know it's kind of hard just to follow along with somebody reads something, but I, I really want you to think about this and maybe make this your, your Saturday manifesto, okay? This weekend, I will attend my church's worship service. I will prepare for that corporate worship event. I will not take the moments lightly. I will see it as a precious time to gather with brothers and sisters in Christ. I will prepare for worship. I will ask God to prepare my own heart. I will ask him to help me hear God's word clearly. I will ask him to speak to me that I might be changed. I will prepare for worship. I pray that I will not be distracted by my own preferences, by the style of music, the length of the sermon, the place where I sit, or anything that would cause me to focus on me instead of God. I will prepare for worship. I will pray that my pastor, I pray for my pastor that the sermon will be anointed. I will pray for strength for my pastor and for encouragement in a world that often offers little. I will prepare for worship. I will pray for other leaders in the church, leaders often unnoticed and unappreciated, and specifically for those who sacrificially care for our children in the services. I will prepare for worship. I will pray that I will hear God's voice in the music, in the prayers, and in every moment that we gather as a body of believers, united in heart, focus, and purpose. I will prepare for worship. I will pray with my family before we leave to go to the church service. I will also pray alone for the services before we leave, even if it's only for a few minutes. I will prepare for worship. As I see fellow believers enter to worship together, I will pray for them and their families, and I will pray for their own hearts of worship. I will prepare for worship. I understand I'm blessed to be able to gather because I know that many Christians around the world are being persecuted and banned from such times. I will prepare for worship. I pray I will understand that it is a foretaste of heaven and that I will never take such times for granted. I pray that I will truly rejoice in the house of the Lord. I will prepare for worship. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you, God, for your goodness and for allowing me these precious moments together to worship you. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Consecrate, prepare, recognize that Jesus is our Sabbath rest, and that we are blessed on the first day of the week coming to worship the one who has redeemed us, who is restoring us, I can't think of a more noble pursuit to use our time for than to spend a day reflecting on his glory and his grace. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you in church this Sunday, prepared and ready.